Professor Robin Dunbar, world known evolutionary psychologist from the Department of Experimental Psychology of Oxford University. Professor, let me ask at the beginning, uh, how many friends you have? More than <laughs> 150 or? Uh, I always say I don't have any friends because I'm not on Facebook. <laughs> okay, but... Uh, In real life, I don't know. I expect it's mm -hmm. about the average. Mm -hmm. About 150. So. Yes, because you are famous for uh, so-called Dunbar's, Dunbar's number, Dunbar's number yes. uh, which uh, reflect the capacity of yes. humans uh, to, to have uh, friends. Uh, but maybe let's talk about something different, because uh, uh, you are also famous for uh, the theory of language evolution. And the key point of your theory is that uh, that uh, grooming is something has something in common with with gossiping. Yes, in in a distant sort of way, in the sense that they both take up a lot of time. I and mean, the thing is, we still do grooming. Grooming is what bonds primates, monkeys, and apes use to create their relationships, to bond their friendships, and we still use that. But uh, it seems to me language has become important eventually when it evolved to allow us to extend the um, uh, number of people that we could create as a community, as it were. So in one sense, yes, gossip is important, a part of that. I'm, I'm now not so sure it's the only important part, and maybe not even at one level the most important part in the, in the sense that storytelling, um, telling the history of a community and who we are, plays a particularly important role in bonding societies. It makes us un feel that we belong to a bigger community. Okay. Uh, we are here uh, at the conference uh, called Ways to Proto Language. You are one of the participants, and could you explain? How should we uh, understand the uh, notion of proto-language, what, what the proto-language is? Tricky problem. Uh, <laughs> a proto-language, uh, we must assume that somehow language uh, went through, developed or evolved through a series of stages from something very simple to the complexity and sophistication we have now. I don't think we really have any understanding of what those early forms might have been, uh, I suspect you have to strip out all the complex embeddedness in, in clauses that we're able to, to produce. It's going to be much, much simpler. And there is an argument, which I think is possibly true, that naming of kin, so being able to say, this is my grandmother, this is my cousin, uh, was a very early important development. And I think that's probably true. Kinship turns out to play a very strong role in the bonding of small-scale communities, even here in Europe. You know, we understand that in traditional hunter-gatherer societies in Africa, for example, or Australia, kinship is important. But it turns out even in modern Europe, where we are not so we're not as quite as family oriented as we used to be. Still, family has priority, and so being able to name this person as part of this club, this special club, uh, is critical. So I suspect. Mm -hmm. So how language developed further? Um, what about abstract concepts and metaphors? No, I think think the whole I mean, the complexity of language lies exactly in. Uh, the role played by things like metaphors, because that's what gives language its richness. But we can't do that without very sophisticated mental skills. And these mental skills appear to be those that are used in mind reading. So we have to be able to understand what you understand by what I'm meaning to say. And this kind of mind reading, reflexive mind reading, then becomes crucial to the success of metaphors. Without that, we can't do metaphors, I don't think. We can't do many things. We, talk, we can't tell complicated stories. Um, and those skills only 
exist at that level in modern humans and our immediate fossil ancestors. So archaic humans, the Neanderthals, the Heidelberg people from Europe and so on, didn't, weren't able to work at that level of complexity. So it may well be that their use of things like metaphor and analogy and so on was much, much impoverished. Do you think that other species are ca ca capable to acquire proto-language, for example, dolphins or bonobos? Because there are such theories. Yes, no, I, I, my view would be you, that you can have a language. Of course you can have a language. Bees have a language. But it's a very, very simple, uh, factually based, often specific to one kind of situation. Um, yes. All the primates communicate to each other, the dolphins, communicate, elephants, communicate, horses communicate, all these species of mammals that live in complex social systems. They all have these communication systems. And they're all kind of very simple forms of language in the sense that they, ha they often have reference. So you can say there is a particular kind of predator over there. Uh, it's not, you, just, you don't give just an alarm call, there is a predator you give an alarm call which says there is a ground predator or an eagle in the air. And they know, they're, you know th those who hear it are able to understand that difference. So that, those kind of simple components to language, I think, are quite old. They're certainly true of most of the primates. Probably there's evidence that it occurs in birds and, and other mammals, like marmots, for example. Um, uh, and, and, you know, so it's probably quite widespread. It's about the nature of how we think about the world. And we think about the world in propositions or statements, causal relationships. So these, these, these building blocks of language, I'm sure, are very, very ancient. The, the real critical thing is the way we use language to really try and influence your mind state and persuade you to do something we want to do. Most of these, these, if you like, more primitive uses of language are in the warning kind of context. And they're not really intended to persuade you to be part of our group. So that how we use, how we use language is to create this sense of community. And that's what dialects do. So here's one of the odd things about language. Why does this capacity which is designed to uh, exchange information, allow you to tell other people how to do something, have this extraordinary capacity to constantly make dialects which prevents that happening. Right? So you don't understand, uh, here in Vroslov they don't understand the people from Krakow because they have a different dialect. <laughs> Even each of us has his own idiolect. Of course, that's right. Yes, exactly. But that seems to me that that's socially that's very important, right? It, it's and and this is a kind of unsung hero, really, of this whole language, the study of language that often gets overlooked. Everybody focuses on how grammar allows us to do these very very sophisticated, complicated things in terms of information exchange, but forgets that also at the same time, built into it is this natural capacity prevent that happening, i.e. to prevent you telling people from another community uh, what it is you, you want your friends to believe. I see. Uh, but what about, uh, for example, famous Bonobo Kanzi, uh, which um, abilities, language abilities as are, I think, extraordinary because I saw uh, videos on YouTube yes. uh, yeah. how, how he yeah. answered the question yeah. of... Yeah. But let, let's be, be fair uh, uh, and say that Kanzi's capacities really are not very sophisticated. At the end of the day, his uh, capacities for language are probably about the same as you might expect as a you know, four or five-year-old human child. And most of it is kind of referential, or, you know, sort of uh, deep, uh, quite, uh, Re requests, so give me this, or you know, he can solve very nicely, and it, it's, if you like simple grammatical structures, in, in the sense of, you know, bring me the ball which is under the plate, 
as opposed to the ball which is on top of the plate, and he can solve that problem. And so that, that if you like, that's a basic, simple form of grammar. And, but I think that's because the way all of us think, animals and well, sophisticated animals and humans think about the world is in these kind of grammatical terms. You know, it's, it's structure, propositional structure, uh, is a natural form of uh, storing information about the world in which we live. And so to make those differences perhaps isn't as clever a thing as m might at first sight seem. It's because we didn't understand they did. Uh, primates can do that kind of thing. Kanzi is therefore very impressive. But if you compare Kanzi with just an ordinary human adult, not even a great writer, um, this is, he doesn't tell very good stories. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, you are an evolutionary psycho psychologist, and um, evolutionary psychology has many opponents uh, because um, these opponents uh, claim that, uh, that evolutionary psychology overestimates the role of uh, biological evolution and underestimates the role of cultural evolution. So do you agree with that criticism? Or you think that, uh, what do you think about cultural evolution? Oh, cultural evolution is clearly very important, right? Um, on the other hand, it's a mistake to assume that then everything about humans has to be explained in terms of cultural evolution. There's a long history of that in the social sciences. But in reality, uh, we, you know, part of that story is our biology and our, our brain, our psychology that we are limited with. Now, at the same time, that doesn't mean to say we're genetically determined, which is what most people assume when you say biology is important. Most people are thinking that we're genetically determined. Uh, so it's a mistake to criticize evolutionary psychology on that grounds, because strictly speaking, uh, evolutionary psychology takes a lot from evolutionary biology, and evolutionary biology is about to strategic decisions that animals make, not about genetic determinism. Now, part of that is determined by the biological inheritance, so the machinery we have. And it's true that the mind will limit what we can do. You know? We are not all Einsteins. This is evidence, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> Unfortunately. Some people are very clever. Uh, and can you know, do write very good stories. Uh, some people uh, uh, can write very good poetry, or they, uh, you know, they can be very clever scientists. And most of us can't. So, if you like, this is just simple evidence that the mind is not completely free; it's limited. But the the issue from a biological point of view is not that the mind constrains you. In biology, there is constraints from everything, and these constraints constantly have to be solved for evolution to occur. But the fact that the organism is making strategic decisions about what's the best way to behave, and these, for species like us and the monkeys and apes, are dependent on having a big brain. And the whole point of having a big brain is to be able to make free decisions, because to have a big brain and be genetically determined we would be extinct a long time ago. Because if you're genetically determined, you don't have the flexibility. And the key to our success is being able to adjust our behavior to local circumstances. And local circumstances is the environment, whether it's climate warming on the big scale or just seasonal changes on the small scale. But it's also the social environment. And these are constantly changing. So we have to be very, very dynamically flexible to be able to uh, respond to that. And that mean, that's what the big brain does. And that's, you can't have behavior that's genetically determined. So if you like, there's mistakes on both sides. Evolutionary psychology sometimes looks as if it's very simple-minded. And maybe some of it is. But that would be a mistake to assume that it has to be like that, or is always like that. And on the other hand, you know, it's, it's a mistake to assume that 
evolutionary psychology assumes everything is okay, fixed and genetically determined. Um, everything, everyone, I think, um, could agree that science is powerful. But do you think that are there any limits of scientific explanation? No. In general, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, most scientists That's would say no. <laughs> I mean, some traditionally scientists have always said. Uh, we can't explain religion, it's, uh, whether God exists or not is not a scientific question, um, which is a, an easy way of escaping the problem. Um, it may be difficult to prove whether God exists or not empirically, and science is about empirical evidence. But on the other hand, there are still lots of things we can study in the context of, let's say, religion, religious mm -hmm. behavior. You know, why are we naturally predisposed to be religious? Mm -hmm. What function does it serve in community, keeping the community together? All these kind of questions. Uh, does, it, does, does being religious make individuals behave better in society? All these questions are empirical questions. We can answer them. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Thank you very much for the interview. A pleasure.